afternoon, everybody, and welcome to welcome to this June 14th meeting of the Tallahassee uh, City Commission Budget Workshop. Uh, I want to um, just remind the audience that if anyone has any comments to make with re regard to the budget, that you would just complete a, a speaker slip, which I believe is on the back table, or is it? They're on the back table. They can bring them. In. Right on the back table, and if you could bring those over and deposit them with Jim Cook. Um, uh, we'll be sure to call on you uh, at the appropriate time. In fact, this may be the appropriate time. Mr. Manager, are there any agenda modifications? No, sir. All right. No agenda mods. Are there any speakers, oh, Treasurer Clerk? Mr. Mayor, we have, uh, I think, about five speakers. The first speaker will be Penny Herman. Uh, she'll be followed by Brent Pichard. Um, I'll ask her and other speakers to come to the podium nearest Commissioner Miller. And if you'll give your name and address for the record, you'll have three minutes for your remarks, and I'll give you a heads up when you, when you get there. Okay, thank you. Penny Herman, Marion Avenue, Tallahassee, Florida. Mayor and Commissioners, I'm here also representing Budget Hawks Group. Budget Hawks and City Commissioners may fi have finally reached common ground. Unfortunately, it may be that we now share the same malady, budget whiplash. The problem started in 2015 when Manager Favors recommended raising the millage rate from 3.7 mills to 4.7 mills. The increase was deemed by the city a public safety budget, even though public safety budget also funded hiring employees for the ethics department, park upkeep, and other department expenses. It was also used to increase subsidies to Star Metro and to give a 3% raise to all employees. The tax increase was eventually reduced to 4.2 mills. As a result of a police grant acceptance, a surplus then occurred in the budget. Simultaneously, a 25% increase in the fire services tax was passed that produced $10 million that was dedicated to fire protection. Last year, the commission wisely lowered the ad valorem rates by a small amount and eliminated the business tax at the urging of the public. In all the discussions, there was no mention by staff that these tax cuts would produce a deficit in the 2018 budget. In fact, general fund capital expenditures of $5 million were built in the new five-year plan, together with increases in general fund salary raises of 2%, according to the city manager, in June 20th of the 2016 budget presentation. Irrespective of that commitment, a 3% raise was proposed by staff for 2018. Just last year at the June budget workshop, the five-year plan showed a fund balance of $3,257,000 in the general fund for 2018. This was presented before the commission voted to lower taxes, but the surplus should have been sufficient to fully cover the revenue decreases resulting from the tax cuts, the business tax cuts and so forth. Instead, we now suddenly face a $4.5 million shortfall in the 2018 budget and going forward for several years with minimal explanation thereof, a fact that was seemingly unknown even 30 days ago at the May 2017 budget workshop. This $4.5 million shortfall is even with an additional $4.5 million in increased revenue in next year's budget from property taxes and other fees. Now with no 2018 budget provided, the Commission is again asked to provide specific budget guidance to the staff who has not furnished the Commission or the public with a proposed budget. How can Commissioners possibly know whether we can afford salary increases when Commissioners have no information on several key budget factors? Those are, what will the police union contract require for 2018? What will the firefighters union contract require for 2018? Will there be additional Star Metro subsidies for 2018? Will Star Metro be awarded the FSU contract for 2018? And what additional increases are part of the budget numbers that have reduced a $4.5 million surplus? Excuse me, that's three minutes. I have one last paragraph, if you will. We again request that you consider appointing a citizen's budget committee to assist in the budget process next year. We also ask that you consider conducting a personnel study by an objective third party that would assist you in determining if our salaries are in line with both public and private employers in the area. Budget Hawks has conducted a survey, which Mr. Brent Pichard will fo follow me up with. And thank you so much for your consideration and your hard work. Great, thank you so much. Uh, next speaker. Next speaker, Brent Pichard, then uh, Rudolph Ferguson. Brent Prashar, 2211 Ellicott Drive, Tallahassee. 
commissioners as the board of directors of an $850 million enterprise, you are charged with making sound financial decisions, not just for the financial health of the city itself, but also for the 189,000 customers that it serves. In making those important decisions, you have two general sources of information, your staff that runs the enterprise day to day and the taxpaying customers that you serve. We believe the flow of information and guidance from staff to you, the commissioners, regarding salary increases and myriad other expenditures is voluminous. The water equivalent of Niagara Falls. We do not see the flow of information from the customer base, however, that ultimately pays the bills back to you as anything other than a mere trickle. We know that demands on your time may not permit you to become experts on every line item in the budget. Nevertheless, that is part of your job. We respectfully request that you leverage your valuable time by inviting input from taxpaying citizens who have found the time to become experts on a wildly undulating budgeting process to the end that Tallahassee can become, in fact, the lowest taxed, the best serving, and the most efficient city in America. And what could possibly be wrong with that as a goal? Budget Hawks and a number of other individuals and organizations are ready, willing, and able to do just that and to become your second source that will assist you in making the very best decisions for the citizens of Tallahassee. All we need is your invitation. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Next speaker. Uh, Rudolph Ferguson and then Lucretia Shaw Collins. Good afternoon. Rudolph Ferguson, 1215 West Thought Street. Pastor Newberg, Tapa, and Eichel of Praise, but I'm here today to talk to you about the Dream Center, which is located at 1215 West Thorp Street. Dream stands for Determined to Reach Excellence and Motivated to Succeed. What I'm handing out to you now is the Dream Center and why it's so necessary that we seek funding for the ultra at risk youth in our community who are pretty much, as, a, as, a, as a, the paper reads, is that are in dire need of our support. It's a new acquired building. We have staff where we deal with anger management, gang resistance. Not only that, we deal with mentoring programs, uh, such as big dreams and high heels for young girls uh, to teach them how to operate as young ladies. We also have programs that deal with the Dreams Campaign, which is taking young kids to be the, the faces as well as the voices of the community. Griffin Height, those who know what Griffin Height is, has, has its problems and its issues. My primary focus and the Dream Center's focus is simple. It is there to work with the young people and the parents of that community to let them know that they can achieve their dreams. So with that being said, I come to you today and to this body and this commission uh, to uh, see how we can work in with this uh, city of Tallahassee can play a role in the Dream Center's future as well as its uh, sustainability. We definitely need your support. We definitely need your hand. And certainly, we definitely need a monetary help to continue the mission with others. We are partnered with the Department of Juvenile Justice, AMI Kids, CCYS, and other entities where young people from our community have uh, already a part of the system. And certainly, uh, lastly, I would say that we have partnered with our churches in the community, as well as the Leon County School Board. So again, I ask you to, uh, as you read the paper about the Dream Center, it's open to the public, working with our young people in the community, not just on Griffin Heights in Frenchtown, but also South City and the South Side of Town. That is my, my presentation. Thank you again for your time. Thank you. Next speaker. Lucretia Shaw Collins and then uh, Jessica Lowe Minor. Good afternoon, afternoon. Mayor Gillum and Commissioners. My name is Lucretia Shaw Collins and I'm the program director at the Bethel Ready for Work Tallahassee Reentry Program, which provides job training, job placement opportunities, and other support services for those persons returning home from prison, county jail, or on probation. <laughs> I want to thank you for your support last budget cycle, and I'm here to request your renewed financial investment on our program. I brought with me our board chair, Doris Malloy, which everyone knows Ms. Malloy because you have a car tag, 
Are you paying your taxes? <laughs> Uh, the Ready for Work program was launched on November 7, 2016. Several of you attended our grand opening on, on December 15, 2016, and we really appreciate your presence and the show of support from the community. In the last six months, we have processed over 400 offenders who we've either met as walk-ins or by phone at our reentry center, at probation offices throughout the Big Bend region, at the homeless shelter, and we've even met them behind bars at the Gaston, Wakulla, Jefferson Correctional Institution, or at our reentry center. I want to report that the 2017 legislature did appropriate $150,000 for our program and reverted and reappropriated the balance of the dollars that we did not expend last fiscal year, which we estimate will be about $250,000. We survived the governor's veto pen. In his message, he actually said that he highlighted our program along with Operation New Hope, and you all met the, the, the president and the CEO of Operation New Hope in, in Jacksonville, along with the Ready for Work Hillsboro program, and he said that we were making cities safer by reducing recidivism, and that we must do everything we can to ensure that the governor and the legislature maintains this kind of level of confidence in our program. I just want to ask that you continue to support us, and if there are any questions, I'm here to answer them. Thank you so very much. Thank you. Next speaker. Next is Jessica Lowe Minor, then Yaley Rockwell. Hi, good afternoon. I'm happy to be here. My name is Jessica Lowe Minor. I'm with the Institute for Nonprofit Innovation and Excellence, located at 300 West Pensacola Street, 32301. Um, I'm here today to talk about a new program that the Institute for Nonprofit Innovation and Excellence is hoping to launch in the fall of 2017. Um, as we are working to become an entrepreneurial startup city, um, the Institute is looking for ways to bring the nonprofit sector into that energy and also help the nonprofit sector be more entrepreneurial and sustainable and vibrant. Um, currently, nonprofits generate one in five dollars in Leon County, and we support one in ten jobs in the community. Um, but we are looking to grow our impact and find ways that nonprofits can uh, be more sustainable uh, over the long term and more resilient, especially as we're anticipating potential federal cuts, potential state cuts. Um, how can we help nonprofits ensure that they're able to continue to provide the services that our residents need um, and support a high quality uh, of life here in Tallahassee? So something that uh, any has, has created is an entrepreneurship boot camp, essentially. It would be a 10-week entrepreneurship program specifically for existing nonprofits who are looking to start or expand an earned inter an earned income enterprise within their nonprofit. So if you think about the Tallahassee Museum and their zip line cores, or Big Ben Cares and their wholesale pharmacy, how can we help more nonprofits do that, have the, the resources that they need, have the brain power, the mentoring, the access to information, and a sound business plan that they would need to launch an earned income strategy within their existing nonprofit. There are entrepreneurship programs that exist in the community, but none of them are specific specifically designed to meet the unique needs of an existing nonprofit. So how do you work with your board of directors to make something like this happen? How do you incorporate an earned income strategy into your existing business plan as your operational nonprofit is continuing to function? Um, and how do you ensure that you are following all of the IRS guidelines as a 501c3 for um, business tax and other things that you might not have been liable for in the past? So we really want to help nonprofits kind of focus on this as a way to move their organizations forward. Um, we do have a um, budget request of the city. I think I've spoken with some of you about it, but we'll be sending a formal presentation uh, proposal to everybody. Um, but we'd be asking for $12,500 to make this happen. So it's a relatively modest investment uh, that we think would have a big impact um, on local nonprofits, and we hope that you'll consider it. Thank you very much. Next speaker. Next speaker is Yaeli Rockwell, and that's the last speaker that I have at this time, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Good afternoon. 
I'm Yaley Rockwell, and I volunteer with an organization called It's Meow or Never, and I'm here as a part of a follow-up from previous discussion we've been having to improve the status quo for homeless cats in our community. Uh, as you know, we have a major problem in the community with uh, homeless animals, stray animals, we call them community cats, and they're breeding all over town and having kittens in dumpsters and people are trying to help them to the best of their ability. So what we've been doing is collaborating to um, do as much as we can, do as much spay neuter as we can, as much rescue and adoption as we possibly can. So um, just to give you a baseline, we were founded in 2007 and we're focused on lessening the population of community cats through uh, humane practices and hands-on facilitation of sterilization. Uh, three years ago, we expanded our mission to include a component of uh, adoption. So um, in that time, we formed partnerships with Be The Solution, the South Georgia Low Cost Spay and Neuter Clinic, Buck Lake Animal Hospital and Pet Supermarket. And together with those partners, we've been able to um, spay and neuter over 700 cats in the past year, a uh, little over a year. And um, that's reduced the potential population by thousands. And with our adoption program that we formalized, we've been able to home and um, find permanent placement for over 250 cats and kittens. So it's a really exciting thing because we're bringing a lot of people together that care about our animals. They don't want to see animals being homeless and suffering and being starving and um, all of that. So it's really great what we've been able to do. But at this time, we are requesting some support from uh, the city to help us move forward. And we want to make Tallahassee a humane city and we should be at the forefront for our state of humane care and hum humane practices. So in that spirit, um, we are asking for some support in the upcoming budget, and we've included a memo about that. But additionally, what we really would need help with is um, a parcel of land. And there seems to be vacant land, and it's all around the area, and it's, it just needs to be pretty much not in a flood zone. We're not picky. But if we were able to have something like that, um, we could provide sanctuary for animals that are in danger, displaced, um, you know, that are being threatened, um, and that sort of thing. So uh, we would like to lease the land, a long-term lease, in order to reach the goal of stabilizing the population of cats to zero growth over the next 12 to 15 years. And I've provided um, the numbers for this in the past, but that's the ultimate goal is, is to have less cats, to have them um, humanely taken care of in the meantime, and then the cycle will end. And other cities have accomplished this. Um, and other cities have sanctuaries uh, that I, like I'm describing. So um, one example is uh, Calvert County, Maryland. They have a sanctuary space that was donated by the county. 198-acre uh, parcel in 2002, and they've been successful too, uh, successful in their efforts to really stabilize the populations there. Excuse me, that's three minutes. Okay, thank you. Um, that's really it. I'm wrapping it up right here and just asking for a little bit of support, and all the details are included, and I really appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, you. Any other speakers? No, sir. All right, thank you to all the speakers, and I do want to uh, acknowledge, albeit she's here in a different capacity, our tax collector, uh, Doris Malloy. Um, you were unwittingly all involved in all these conversations because we write our checks to you um, uh, in, this, in this regard. Uh, that being said, I'll turn the presentation over to the city manager. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Commissioners, um, today's workshop will provide an overview of our projections for FY18. Uh, these projections are based on the priorities you have set to emphasize infrastructure and public safety. And obviously, they include all the decisions that you make throughout the year, uh, giving us the wise direction uh, and input, and they're reflected here. Overall, your general fund expenses are projected to exceed revenues by $4.5 million as we sit here today. Uh, based on the input you give us today and the hard work that the leadership team and our staff has been doing uh, over the last couple of months, uh, we will finalize those between June 14th today and June 28th uh, and bring you a balanced budget that reflects all your input on June 28th. Uh, a number of budget options are summarized in your agenda material, and Robert Wiggin is here to walk us through that material. Before we do that, quick question, Mr. Manager or uh, City Attorney. How 
early in the process is it uh, possible for us to indicate our uh, desires around not doing a millage increase if that's what we want to, if is that what we want to decide? I only preface it this way, commissioners, because when we voted for the last increase, at least for me, it was a five-year horizon. And um, obviously new facts can change situations and whatnot, uh, but uh, I'm still where we were when we uh, decided uh, on that issue. So uh, I am curious in the process, at what point is it, I know there's a schedule for when we've got to give notice to the appraiser, uh, but what is appropriate by way of indicating our preference and frankly, giving guidance to staff that there, if, if it's the preference of the board, that there won't be new revenue by virtue of a tax increase, uh, but rather that we'd have to find uh, ways to, to meet the obligation within the current constraints. Well, we have to have that done by July 1, but there would be uh, no prohibition on doing it earlier, including today, next meeting. Uh, yeah. So you, you could go forward with that. Certainly, I think you're correct that it does, it does help staff as early as you uh, can give that indication. Commissioner Ziffer. It's, it's August 1, by the way. Yeah, I'm sorry, August 1. <laughs> yeah, but August 1, July 1. Um, we had um, extensive discussions last year, and we had extensive discussions the year before, and um, much like you, Mayor, um, I think there was an expectation that we would be where we are and that's where we would be. So I'm going to go ahead right now and make a motion that we stay at 4.1 mills. Second. There's a motion and a second that the uh, uh, next year's budget, 2017-2018 uh, budget, remain at the same millage uh, 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 as today, 4.1 mil, uh, mills. Commissioner uh, Maddox. I was going to make the, the same motion. This is clearly a, a, a year that we should tighten our belt to ensure that we meet all our obligations and uh, we should not look for additional revenue through tax increases. Mr. Richardson. Mr. Mayor, thank you. I, you know, I, I, I didn't anticipate that it would take a motion, I think, uh, and I'm certainly going to vote for the motion, but based on the conversations that we had last year, I thought it was clear that, uh, you know, when we were moving forward with last year's budget, uh, that it was not the, uh, that, that it was a five-year window, that we wanted some predictability uh, for the citizens in the community so that they could plan their budgets over the next several years and not have to consider paying additional property taxes, at least for the city. And so, um, uh, like I said, I, I, I didn't anticipate that it would take a motion, but if it takes that to give staff the direction that they need for this year, uh, then certainly I will support that. Thank you. Commissioner Miller? Oh, I'm sorry. I thought I saw you. Um, yeah, Commissioner yeah, My Zipper. motion was not only give direction, that's it. We're making the vote today. Yeah. Um, our tax collector's over there. You know what our millage rate is now. <laughs> uh, Commission, hopefully. yeah, hopefully. Uh, commissioners, um, uh, there is a motion in a second on the floor to give instruction to staff around no millage increase uh, for the 2017-2018 budget. Um, all those in favor of the motion, let it, uh, Commissioner. Me, Mayor. Commissioner. My understanding is that the motion is to set the millage increase. It does set it okay, thank uh, you. At, at, at the current rate. Or the millage rate, not the millage <laughs> increase. I at, misspoke. Oh, right. I? I, I think we all understand. All right, That's right. Jesus. Uh, all those in favor of the motion, let it be known by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, no. Motion passes unanimously. Uh, Mr. Manager, I know that gives, uh, <laughs> Mr. says we're done. Uh, at least it gives us some um, guidance uh, under which we can operate in making some, some decisions going forward. Yes, sir, that's uh, tough love. Uh, uh, just, just for your information, you have your executive team in front of you. Um, absent is uh, Ms. Cynthia Barber. She's dealing with, uh, with a personal issue at home and uh, she'll make it as uh, uh, soon as she can. Thank you. It's not that she doesn't care. <clears throat> um, thank you, Commissioners. Uh, Mayor, appointed officials, and city manager, uh, as you all know, we have a, a scheduled budget meeting to talk about some, some uh, choices to make, uh, given a clear direction on the millage rate. Uh, we'll talk about the other parameters of, of what we're dealing with as we move forward. Uh, and get some additional feedback and, and uh, input from you on, the, on those directions. Um, for the agenda today, um, some of the things that I'd like to do is um, 
talk about uh, some of the major assumptions that are in the fiscal year 18 budget. Uh, we really uh, talk in a lot of terms, A through Z, 1 through 10, in linear terms, but what we're dealing with is, is I'd ask you to look at it as if it was a wheel. As we make adjustments on one side of a, of, of a, a wheel with spokes, uh, we have to go around and make adjustments uh, around that entire wheel. Uh, and that's what I think we've been through uh, over these last eight months as we've gone through the budget process. Uh, we've had uh, eight budget meetings uh, that have encompassed um, uh, close out of the previous fiscal year, uh, quarterly updates to let you know where we are currently with our current budget so we can make decisions for the, for the coming year, um, setting clear strategic goals uh, and, and actions that you want, that you want us to follow. And, um, and then other meetings and workshops to discuss the, the assumptions that, are, uh, that the budget encompasses. Uh, what we've got today in the uh, general fund pro forma and the, all the fund pro formas are those assumptions uh, established in, in dollars. Um, you know, based on these assumptions, uh, we've got the initial resu results and then we'll finally ask you in this workshop to give us some feedback on, on actions that the departments are doing concurrently as we put these assumptions to numbers so that they have clear operational guidance in establishing how they uh, are going to provide services at the high standards that you've set that you've set for us. Uh, we've identified what the remaining budget workshops uh, in, are, in include uh, June 28th to bring additional details uh, from those departments. Uh, a budget workshop that uh, typically is to vote on the millage rate, which we've done now. Uh, we can advertise then that millage rate by the August uh, 1st deadline. Um, and then um, two workshops, uh, first hearing and final hearing in September to adopt uh, uh, the, the, the budget for the for the coming fiscal year. The, uh, the budget process to date uh, has included a quarterly uh, reporting on the status of a budget. Um, you know, the third quarter will be updated uh, July 19th so that we have further information on, on where we stand and, and where we're going um, in, in the next fiscal year. Um, we've got, I mentioned the strategic workshops that we've had for public safety, public infrastructure, um, and then an update on Star Metro uh, and, and what the fund status is there. Uh, we've also uh, worked on transparency and participation in the budget process. Uh, we've had about um, uh, hundreds of visits monthly uh, to OpenGov uh, where, where we publish the budget. Um, as, uh, as the community has asked for information, we've been able to add it to that, uh, to that resource. Uh, and we've had nearly 1,500 visits for the, for the calendar year. Uh, the most promising part about that is that we see an increase before the budget meeting and after the budget meeting, and so it's, it's, it's acting as a resource to, to support the community questions that they have about the budget process. Um, the, the feedback that we've received, again, is confirmed that uh, public safety and, and roadway and sidewalk investments are the highest priority, and we continue to reflect that in the budget. So as far as a fiscal year 18 budget plan, again, the, I'll go through these very quickly. You know, infrastructure and public safety are priority areas. No millage rate increase, uh, which you've made very clear um, today with your vote. Um, operating costs are held at 2017 levels for the general fund. Uh, utilities and uh, enterprise funds are, are addressed by uh, ordinance uh, for CPI increases as we've established by policy. So Robert, given what you have here in black and white, you all had anticipated that we probably would not uh, uh, support a millage increase. So you have built this budget based on maintaining the 4.1 millage rate. Correct. Okay, thank you. Uh, and, and that's uh, showing the difference between uh, revenues and expenditures uh, uh, is, is what we're going to work on next. Okay, Yes. thank you. Also to clarify, there is no budget in front of us. Yeah. You all are dealing with assumptions. There is no budget. Correct. The assumption being that th we wouldn't support a 4.1 millage increase. <laughs> yes, that, that increase in the 4.1 mil, yes. mil rate. Yes. Uh, we've also made assumptions on the budget plan that there are no increase in workforce, with the exception of 15 uh, officers in the cops uh, in, in in public safety for the cops program. Uh, we've assumed a 3% cost of living based on performance. Uh, pension increases have been updated per actuarial rate study assumptions, 
and then we've maintained and uh, assumed maintaining the Promise Zone funding in, in the CHSP and, and COCA uh, grant funding areas. Uh, using these assumptions and guidance, uh, we've analyzed external economic indicators, projected property taxes and sales taxes uh, and other revenues. We've identified actual and estimated salary and benefit costs, uh, looked at consumer price index increases for the enterprise funds, and this is all in order to uh, reflect those outcomes in a five-year fund pro forma. Um, for the general fund, drivers include uh, the growth in property taxes uh, of $1.4 million at the 4.1 mil uh, rate, uh, repeal of the business tax of uh, the business tax repeal was $1.9 million impact overall in that uh, category of costs uh, of revenues. It's a $1.6 million impact. Um, and then overall about a seven tenths of a percent growth across all revenue categories. Uh, the table that we're showing there is uh, fiscal year 17 adopted, fiscal year 18 preliminary uh, numbers that we've uh, you know, established based on the assumptions, and then we've uh, shown a dollar and percent change by major account category on that table for you. Just to point out, your assumptions for 2017 are lining up pretty much with uh, the actual. The, the actual. Yes, uh, we, we've we've talked about a little bit of. Uh, 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 impact in, in weather on sales and the utilities. Uh, we've talked about the impact of overtime in Star Metro and the actions they're taking, um, but we are looking at uh, generally balanced budgets across the 14 operating funds. And uh, again, we'll, we'll update that and confirm that in the third quarter on June 19th. Uh, yes. Please, Commissioner. Um, under licensing and permits, I see that you've references, you're referencing the services tax. Um, that's Commissioner, would you mind bringing your microphone down? I see that you're referencing the communication services tax. Could you elaborate on that a little bit? It's $1.6 million, almost 1.7, so that's yeah, a lot. Decrease. Uh, over, over time, it has decreased, and, and we're seeing that as a pretty uh, consistent trend over time. Um, our estimates, I think, for um, 18 have it in the in the in the hundreds of thousands of dollars reductions, um, it, it's a move of, of, <coughs> of the population from uh, using landlines. landlines to cell phones, uh, different tax structures for those for those bills. So, and this is what it's going to be, 1.7. Um, that uh, that that that's the entirety of the category. Uh, the some smaller portion of that is for the communication ser services tax, and I can give you those amounts. Didn't I see building fees in here somewhere decreasing? Uh, inspection it, fees or something like that? We, when we're talking, part of this? Yes, when we're looking at options uh, for going forward, uh, we uh, do have a recommendation from um, the internal audit department that we review the fees for growth management. All right, but thank you. Building inspection fees are in the, <clears throat> in the building inspection fund. Oh, so they're okay. not reflected on All here. Right. This Correct. isn't and, part and of the, it. All right, thank the you. The big driver on the, on the cell phone landline yeah, I understand category that. is that cell phones are the tax is accrues to the community where the account is. So in our case, with how many students we have, a lot of those students have accounts in wherever they come from. Uh, and those taxes get paid to those communities rather than us. I see. Uh, so that's a big driver that affects us. Everybody's affected negatively, but we're more so because we have so many students. And in the past, landlines were in, in the community where you were. So uh, that's a big driver. Thank you. And Commissioner Miller, we have confirmed it's about a $350,000 reduction in uh, going forward in fiscal year 18 that we're estimating. All right. Beyond the revenue side of the uh, of the equation, uh, the fiscal year 18 through 22 general fund pro forma uh, is also guided by certain drivers that uh, that that we've established over time. Um, you know, the two primary ones are an assumption of 6.5 million dollars for uh, uh, roadway and sidewalk maintenance. Uh, that's an increased commitment over uh, fiscal year 
uh, 15, uh, where we were not investing at that level in our infrastructure, uh, increased that to $5 million last year, and, and we're increasing that based on uh, public infrastructure's uh, strategic plan for addressing roadway and sidewalk maintenance uh, going forward. Um, we also have personnel cost increases uh, as a commitment to the public safety positions, 15 of them, uh, pension and then health care costs across the organization. And what's reflected here is the, the portion that impacts the general fund, uh, the public safety sector, uh, parks and recreation, public infrastructure, uh, the, those, those entities. Uh, again, this chart displays uh, the expense account by, for fiscal year 17, uh, the uh, preliminary estimates for fiscal year 18, and then um, the amount of dollar and percentage change year over year by cost category and the expenditure side of the business. And, and Commission, the, the biggest driver on the, on the pension cost is a good news, bad news story. So the good news is we're living longer uh, as a society on the average. And the bad news is that the longer you live, the more you collect pension and the more expensive that becomes. Mm. And Tom now, now is Sir? Tom Cohn must be killing us. <laughs> yeah, 102. Uh, <laughs> but uh, the, the, the use of these mortality tables is now mandated by the state, and this is the first time we've had to use it, and we're using them. Thank you, Rick. <clears throat> Continuing on with the uh, overall perspective of the general fund pro forma. Uh, you know, in, in looking in total, we have got about $1.1 million in assumptions for growth in general fund revenue. Um, we've got about $5.6 million growth in general fund expenditures. Um, that, that is what accounts for the $4.4 million um, uh, shortfall in, in revenue as compared to expenditures. Uh, we've shown a summary chart um, on that same page of fiscal year 17 uh, approved budget. Uh, the pre preliminary fiscal year 18, 19, 20 through 22 budget. Uh, you'll notice that, that as you go across the years, there's a slight decrease in the out years. Uh, that reflects uh, as we shift um, uh, the, the grant funded positions uh, for the police uh, uh, cops program as, as, they, uh, as they cycle out of the, out of the budget um, over time. Um, the, the same assumptions and guidelines that we've discussed uh, have been applied to the 14 operating funds. Uh, when we look at the results there, they suggest that they're within a uh, reasonable margin for adjustment. Uh, there are a few items that I want to point out that we have assumed. Um, uh, Star Metro assumes a continuation of the FSU contract. Um, with the information we have now, that's the best um, estimate that we have, and so we're, 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 uh, we're waiting until we get those uh, uh, results back and then would make any adjustments at that time, but at this time we're, we're assuming that that contract will continue. Uh, the water and sewer are uh, both going through rate studies uh, and they're progressing with, we, with an expected uh, return to talk about some of the r recommendations from that rate study. Um, we think that if any changes occur, it's going to be because of investment in the infrastructure and, um, and we'll reflect that in, in any uh, pro formas at that time based on, the, on those results. I have a question. Sure. Mr. Sure, please. CDBG, SHIP, HUM, and ESG, federal funds. Yes. We, we have, uh, you've not seen those before, and that was my next note. Uh, we typically have addressed uh, the approval of those, the receipt of those, um, and the budgeting of those through an agenda item. Um, we're now, uh, combining the two, uh, the, that, uh, those uh, community service agenda items with, with the budget agenda item, and that's why you're seeing these for the first time. Are we time. sure those funds are going to be at that level next year? Um, we are not, but... Yeah, um, I mean, that's the federal budget, and those are all four things that the, at least the budget that was presented by the president have pretty significant cuts in. So I think, I think those are things that we need to be highlight, as I recall, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, from our understanding is that the 18 amounts are going to be the same as 17, and then moving forward uh, is where you'll start seeing the cuts from the information that we've received. Okay. Has the 18 budget been done yet? There's a compromise reached, uh, but I don't think there'll be a budget. I think it's a continuing, continuing resolution. resolution. But, uh, 
we'll keep an eye on those. I think we need to watch that. Good point. We will. And we stay plugged in. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, at, so at the same time that these assumptions have been uh, plugged in to, uh, to develop the budget prelim preliminary budget estimates, um, departments are concentrating on their operations. Uh, you know, we, they, they're reviewing the structure of the organization for opportunities to improve efficiency and reduce cost um, within their boundaries, within the boundaries that we've established that customer services need to remain uh, as high as they are, uh, the same as they are. Um, they're, uh, and that efficiencies that they're finding should be focused on uh, making improvements in services uh, in, in what they provide. Um, so as they go through that process, and, and that's what we want to bring back on June 28th to talk in more detail, we wanted to talk about some of the areas that they're looking at, and those include uh, functional consolidation and workforce reductions, um, insourcing and outsourcing, uh, employee cost benefit sharing, and then other cost considerations as the four categories. Uh, speaking to uh, functional consolidations and workforce reductions, uh, we've already achieved success in the public infrastructure department in that regard. Um, we've combined inspections that were formerly in streets uh, and combined with uh, operations in uh, underground utility, uh, and those inspection services are better coordinated and, and can focus on overall needs uh, of the city. Uh, we brought sewer inspection technology to bear on drainage systems, and the number of miles inspected has been greatly increased. Um, combining utility repair relocations with street resurfacing crews, uh, crews are better coordinated, uh, uh, response times are reduced, and we've allowed one crew to be freed up to, uh, to do milling work on sidewalks. Uh, these are some of the same exercises that the departments uh, are going through as they experience the reorganization, uh, and they're making recommendations on that next set of, uh, of functional consolidations. Um, after a year of experiencing uh, what do the actual operations in, encompass, uh, they can make an, another set of recommendations, and that that's what we've asked them to do for the 28th. Um, if, you know, in one respect, those are work groups that have been combined within a department and are being, in, the efficiencies are increased, the additional um, uh, uh, work hours are being applied to to needs that they have and or there are cost savings. Uh, we're also asking that if there are work groups in different uh, funds and, and across different uh, uh, departments that those also be combined and, and those recommendations are being brought back. Um, you know, one, you know, along with the streamlining, consolidation and reorganization, uh, there are going to be staffing impacts. Uh, when, when there are going to be staffing impacts, the departments have been asked to look at if they can be accomplished by attrition. Uh, if they can be accomplished by uh, near-term retirements, um, if they can be re uh, addressed by va current vacancies that we have open that we then uh, uh, do not budget. Uh, but ultimately, if this is going to be a long-term sustainable change, uh, then layoffs may be necessary. And, and we'll, we'll talk in more detail as we have those details from the departments. Uh, insourcing and outsourcing. Um, we've made decisions in the city of Tallahassee regarding the use of outside vendors to implement new forms of technology uh, when we needed that experience to be brought to, to bear. Uh, once we understand that new technology, in many cases, we're able to then um, uh, use that technology ourselves um, and or develop the applications or the, uh, the, the capabilities in, internally. Um, so that insourcing and outsourcing is a, uh, an ebb and flow depending upon where we have the experience, where we have the skills, uh, where we have the training and or how quickly we can develop that to in-house to, uh, to bring that to bear. Um, you, know, the, the, these de, you know, these kind of determinations are, are, are also being looked at across the departments and being brought back uh, uh, for uh, recommended impacts on the budget uh, in this next coming two weeks. Uh, we're, uh, some examples of, of that technology, mobile technology for, for uh, uh, sending, uh, sending crews into the field, uh, software-based solutions, application-based technology, and then um, you know, universal adoption of uh, GPS-based systems so that we can be more efficient uh, in, in working uh, crews out in the, out in the community. Um, we also uh, have been looking at 
uh, market forces and as those change over time, then reconsidering whether a contract service is the better, best way to accomplish a, a, a service. Uh, I think we're coming to the realization based on recommendations we've received and direction from you that some building services and contract service uh, uh, services may be changed, may be brought in-house for the, to, to match the skill set of the, of the people that we have for them to do the work. Um, from time to time, the city will reassess employee share of the benefit plan costs and make a determination on the appropriate rates that we share. Uh, we currently have general government employees contributing 3.75% um, of, of their pay to the pension plan. This doesn't reflect uh, police or fire uh, pension um, contributions, which are in the 11 to 19% range. Um, another consideration when we talk about employee benefit cost sharing is health care. Um, you know, quality health care is, is, is key to recruiting employees uh, and also to their health for, for when they're working. Um, and so we talk about sharing those costs. Uh, by policy, we, we, we stay within a 70%, 30% share where the city mat, uh, meets a 30%, 70% a obligation and the employees meet a 30% obligation of the health care costs. Um, and when we're considering the 5% uh, increase in health care that we're looking at, we're putting that in the context of what the raise will be and what impacts that will have on, on uh, employees, uh, whether they be uh, uh, single employees, employee plus one, or employee plus family. Uh, Robert, I was under the impression that our health care costs were going up 5.8%, which is closer to 6. Is that right? Yes, that's the uh, health care cost. Right. Uh, <clears throat> over and above what you're paying now, it is not 6% so of the The increase is 5.8% in the health care cost, right? The cost. Thank you. And, and, and that's not a, we don't have that, that's not a final number. All right. That's our assumption. Commissioner. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Robert, um, when you, here you talk about the employee benefit cost sharing and talk about the, um, uh, I guess periodic uh, actuarial study pay and compensation comparison studies that that you all uh, perform. When was the last time we did that, and how did how did the city of Tallahassee compare with comparably sized cities? Well, I, I, the discussions we've had most recently are um, uh, some of the uh, MIT results. Uh, that show what a, a living wage is. And uh, when we looked at the organization, uh, there were just a, a less than a handful of individuals who were below that standard. Um, okay. and, and so I, I feel very comfortable that we are paying a living wage um, and uh, we'll want to understand what the impacts of these pension changes, these health care changes are, respective of what we're proposing as a raise, uh, okay. so that we have the full picture. And, and in addition, Commissioner, uh, it's an ongoing process. It's very fluid. Uh, we, I don't, th I don't remember this a lot of years ago. The last time, Penny may have been here. The last time we did a uh, a full citywide uh, cost study. It, that's a very painful process. Yeah. Uh, so what we use is sort of rotational, as we we kind of sense from when we're filling positions, the number of applicants you're getting. Uh, the amount of interest, how hard it is to get it, which areas we should concentrate the resources of our human resources department <laughs> to evaluate whether we're in the market or not. And obviously we do that every three years or so when we do, when we go into negotiations with the unions. But it, it rotates and you just know which areas you're having trouble filling uh, and then you go back and adjust those and then you see the market change and sometimes it changes the other way. Uh, so I, I, like Robert said, I'm, I'm, I'm really confident that we're in a good place on our salary structure and what we're paying employees and our benefit package for sure. Okay. And as far as the cost sharing, it ebbs and flows also over time. If you go back to the early 90s, uh, employees were contributing 7% to the pension fund. And over time, with the stock market doing well and other, and other considerations, it went down all the way to 2%. And then now it's come back to where it is today, which I think is three and three quarters. Uh, so it moves with the times and it moves with 
the results of our actuarial studies and, uh, and obviously the investments uh, in the plan. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Uh, some other cost considerations that we're uh, uh, that we're uh, in including in this review is uh, there are user fees that are in place across the city, um, and um, they are periodically adjusted. Uh, again, based on uh, best practice, based on um, studies. Um, you know, many were last updated more than five and or ten years ago, um, and and they don't include CPI and in escalators like we do in the utilities. And so it may be time to take a look at what where those are and, and what the market will bear. Um, you know, e you know, each year in reviewing those fee structures, we recognize that there's a public benefit to many of those fees, and so uh, there there's a conscious decision to uh, reduce what we recover, and we'll maintain those considerations when we're looking at uh, those publicly beneficial areas, parks and recreation, um, uh, some of the uh, uh, growth management areas that 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 aren't part of the in building inspection process. Um, and, uh, but, but that's also an area that we've asked the departments to look at and, and give us feedback on. Uh, from time to time, we also renegotiate contracts uh, for citywide services, uh, cell service, uh, uniforms, uh, and then standard contracts. Uh, th those experiences change over time. We make assessments of what the need is, what the best uh, product is, uh, how we provide that product, and then also uh, how, how we uh, supply our, our employees with those products. Um, those, those, uh, those contracts are being reconsidered and, uh, and evaluated to see if they're still in good standing and what updates we need to make uh, to, to, for cost considerations in that area. Um, you know, you've given us clear guidelines. Uh, we've gotten clear feedback from the public. Uh, we've got known assumptions in estimating a budget plan. Uh, and, and once we receive this feedback on streamlining reorganizations, uh, we'll bring back department proposals and recommendations consistent with today's dis discussion. You know, the primary considerations that we're asking you to give feedback on are, um, uh, you know, continued reorganizations. Uh, that follow up on the uh, citywide reorganizations as the department learned the experience of, of, of being in, the, in a new organizational uh, 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 chart or schema. Uh, met, uh, insourcing or outsourcing we'd ask for feedback on, and then other cost considerations that we've mentioned like employee cost uh, sharing. Mr. Uh, Ziffer. Um, you may not know the answer. Um, okay. That was it. Um, Time's up. There's a bill that went through the legislature this year um, um, for um, telecommunications that will allow the um, wireless companies to put equipment on our poles around town. Um, the technology is probably not going to be available until 2020, but when 2020 hits, they can go on just about anything we have, and the most we can charge them is $150 a pole, whereas I think right now we negotiate when they put things on polls you may want to start to give some consideration as to what kind of impact that's going to have it's sitting on the governor's desk and i'm thinking he's probably going to sign it we're, we're trying to stop him from doing that but it could be significant um and um, just a heads up on that and maybe take a look at what kind of income we generated thus far when it comes to the um, wireless if they're on any of our polls what the average fee they're paying because if it's up, upwards of over 150 dollars we're about to lose some dollars and just, uh, Commissioner, you may be able to clarify, but does that include um, not just the telecom folks, but... Oh, yeah, I'm sorry, anybody. It, it, this is anyone who rents space on our poles, uh, I believe. And it's, um, it, it could be pretty significant. The 5G technology also um, involves, and this is something our citizens probably need to know about because it's going to be pretty darn ugly, um, being blunt, because these pieces of equipment are about the size of a refrigerator, and we really can't stop them. We can ask them to go through the permitting process and we can try to restrict, but in the end, they can do whatever they want to do because that's the way the bill's written. Um, it goes in an octagon. So if you have one, then within a certain distance, there will be other ones and they can go just about anywhere they want. Well, they can go on our light poles, they can go on our um, um, traffic signal poles, anywhere in the right of way. DOT's exempt, anything that's part of the state. They're exempt. I'm not sure how that happened. So you may want to start to give consideration to that. Okay. 
We will. Thank you. Small, small cell technology. I think yep. it's. Um, I had a, a bullet to talk about millage rate considerations uh, uh, between now and July anymore. 19th, and I think we've uh, well established what our, <laughs> what our decision is there, so I can uh, skip to the next page there. Um, some of the next steps that we'll, uh, we'll be doing is um, we'll have additional opportunities for public involvement. Um, you know, we'll keep information um, and interaction provided in OpenGov. Um, you know, we, we'll have continued meetings with stakeholders. Uh, and then the city's online budget is on Telgov. I'd like to mention uh, just a, a, a personal uh, amount of credit for the for the financial management staff. This is the first year that we've gone online with our, our budget and we received the GFOA Distinguished Budget uh, Award and uh, we're trying to find out who else is, has, has taken that step to go from a paper document to an online document and still be able to uh, meet the standards that are that are expected of us. Great. So it's a great credit to the uh, financial management staff who who undertook that effort. Um, and then we'll have future budget workshops. Um, you know, the recommended um, but not required uh, steps in those budget workshops is to finalize a recommended budget. Um, we've approved the tentative millage rate to advertise. Uh, we expect to do a third quarter update in July and then also talk about the, the capital improvement plan at that time. And then we've got the first public hearing um, September 13th and a, and a final adoption of the budget September 27th. So we have uh, got plenty of opportunities to continue to develop the budget and make final decisions. Okay, okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, question on the, um, last year we did prioritize our law enforcement expenses um, uh, to make way for the hiring of new law enforcement officers. And I haven't seen the chief, so I'm not sure, but they are the largest cost impact in the general budget. Uh, and it would be helpful to get an update as to what the status of affairs are, whether the priorities are where they need to be, um, are there additional asks, uh, what he's learning and experiencing from other communities so that we can make sure we stay on top of that. We made a pretty, the taxpayers, I should say, made a pretty substantial investment here, uh, and uh, it'd be appropriate to hear back on where we sit. Thank you. Yeah, and I think uh, also, Mr. Mayor, uh, you know, the survey results have indicated and support what we've done, and the community is saying that public safety is still a, the priority area. Yes. Uh, and so we, we know that we're on the right path in that respect. Commissioner Maddox. I agree, Mr. Mayor. I think that we need to see details on this. I mean, what the rash of violent crime over the last month and a half has shown us is that we cannot tax our way out of a crime problem. So I'd like to see what, what analysis there is as to why these crimes are being committed and the enforcement mechanisms that we think could best address them. Uh, and, and it may be reprioritizing within TPD's budget. Uh, but until we get that information, we won't know. Uh, I want to underscore your, your point around, so first of all, to give uh, to, uh, more, com you know, our, our most complete picture here is that this commission has taken, I think, a pretty diverse uh, approach to dealing with this, to include uh, human services funding. You know, we heard from Lucretia earlier uh, and, and uh, Ms. Malloy around the reentry piece, which we know that there there's big forbearing uh, uh, on that, some of the human services folks that we've dealt with. Um, one agency I'm thinking of in particular, uh, you know, share with us the state statistics that indicate that children who have at least one adult uh, parent incarcerated are like nine times out of 10 likely to be incarcerated themselves. Um, I, I mean, I've never seen indicators uh, so strong and, and correlate so closely. Uh, so the comprehensive approach is the right one to take. That being said, uh, when you're dealing with the most violent in our society and in our community, um, the, the level of analysis and sophisticated approach is so critical. I mean, I know that there are lots of crimes that could be committed that we never hear about because of the amount of law enforcement that goes into preventing bad things from happening in the first place, which I think it would be helpful to have some context on. But then there are the ones that happen that it only seems, well, we are, you know, we're very quick to solve the crimes. The question becomes what intelligence, what do we know? What concentric circles are we drawing to anticipate 
what might happen as a result of, for instance, a shooting happens in one part of our town, we know while we don't have gangs necessarily, you have folks we've certified as being people who are of interest, we can pretty well anticipate that there may be retribution on the other side. Uh, and so I'm curious, what are the interventions that are happening there? Um, for a while, the, you know, the chief indicated, you know, he was new and was was getting a hold of the budget and, and putting that under the belt. Well, that isn't true anymore. Um, um, we've allocated the resources. We've done what we've been asked to do as a commission. Uh, and now it's really important that we start to see, uh, one, are we on the right track? Uh, or whether real changes need to be made, whether there are additional resources that need to be identified. Frankly, what are we learning from other communities and how are we then implementing what we learn right here in our own community? Um, there's a lot there. Uh, and I've said this over email requesting that we get as regular updates as we can because it doesn't help to read about this stuff. I mean, we are part of the government, uh, which means we should be, um, we should be very clear around um, uh, uh, the updates uh, as to, to the strategies being undertaken from from month to month. I mean, almost a war rooming of it, right? Because uh, I was at, I don't know how many of y'all attended uh, Longest Table events on Sunday, but I was at one and it was, it was a paradox because the folks who I was sitting with, you know, kept saying one of the reasons why they love this city is it's safe and it's clean and they love the outdoors and they love the parks. And the only thing that has shook in their confidence of late has been the latest rash of, of, of incidents. And I'll say, well, now I'm concerned about crime. And what I tried to reassure at least the table I was sitting at is that there isn't a very, unlike a lot of places, there's not a very random nature to it. Uh, this does seem to be an element and there are also a number of relationships. And so um, most folks would admit that they don't walk out of their house afraid that something's gonna happen to them. That's not the nature of it. Um, uh, but that doesn't excuse us out of having to address what is uh, a pretty real and present um, 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 uh, uh, set of facts for a lot of folks who do live uh, in the city and in the community. So, yes, Commissioner. Thank you. I just, I won't say in defense of the chief, but I know that he is aggressively uh, implementing the community oriented policing model. And I think that's starting to pay some dividends. We were out um, this past Friday, I think it was at the uh, Operation Safe Neighborhoods. and. There were lots of police officers. We were in the Griffin Heights community, uh, Pastor Ferguson, and um, I just happened to be walking with the police officer who was shot at seven times uh, over in the Bond community, and he was sharing with me that experience. Point being that that's how dedicated they are to this community and solving uh, issues in the community before they, before they become issues if you will, being out in the neighborhood and meeting the neighbors and assuring them that, you know, we, we, we are concerned about what happens in their neighborhood. And if, if an incident occurs and they see something or hear something that when they call, that there will be a rapid response, that their cries for help won't uh, be ignored. So I, so I know the chief is doing that and, and his staff, they're very aggressive uh, out in the community in that respect. Uh, in terms of the uh, community-oriented uh, policing model. Um, and so it's, it's, it's interesting because I was at a longest table uh, uh, event uh, in the Springfield community. And had I not brought up the issue of crime, nobody at, in, uh, at any of the other tables brought it up. And we were in Springfield. And so it was interesting that that was the case. Uh, but when I brought it up, of course, then some people started talking. Uh, one young lady said that in the neighborhood where she lives, they are now putting in electronic gates. And uh, they, they did express some concerns about crime. But had I not brought it up uh, as one of our priority issues, I, I don't know that anybody else would have brought it up. And there were some of our neighbors there from uh, South City uh, uh, from from Griffin Heights, of course, or Springfield. Uh, so I think we are doing some things right. And like I said, Mayor, I, I haven't talked with anyone yet who tells me that they are so afraid in the city of Tallahassee that they don't even want to walk out of their door. I don't know that, that 
a lot of people have that sense that our city has gotten to that point. Uh, and there was one young lady and her husband that were there from Milwaukee, and she said, well, you know, compared to Milwaukee, you know, Tallahassee is a safe city to be. So I think we are doing some things right uh, in all of the approaches that we're taking. The uh, Future Leaders Academy, uh, getting those young people off the street and giving them something to do, and we probably need to continue increasing the number of those that are involved, the uh, reentry program and, and working with those that are uh, coming back into the community af after having been incarcerated, uh, working with neighborhoods through Kona and CAN and uh, some of the other neighborhood initiatives that we've got going on. So it's going to take all of us working together. We can't police our way out of it, as you said, uh, Commissioner Maddox, but uh, it's going to have to be a multifaceted approach with all of us working together to address this thing. And um, I'll say this and then I'm done. I was talking to a young lady, Congressman Lawson, had her call me. They've had apparently a rash of car burglaries in the Callan neighborhood um, here recently. And, and so I talked to her about them establishing a crime watch uh, program and, and you know what they're doing to look out for each other as neighbors. Uh, and she said that, that you know, Apparently they hadn't thought about that, but that's something that she would now take back uh, to her neighbors and they would try to implement uh, in the Callan neighborhood. So it's gonna take all of us uh, working on this together and uh, certainly given the police, the resource, the uh, chief rather, the resources that he needs uh, is important, uh, but it's gonna be, it's gonna have to be a community-wide effort. Our businesses, our neighborhoods, our neighborhood associations, uh, even uh, all the way down to individual households uh, being involved uh, in this. Um, I want to acknowledge you, Mr. Ziffer, but I just want to say my comments are by no means an attack on frontline folks. I actually think that those, are, you know, uh, we owe a lot of gratitude for uh, the work that is being done and that is happening there. My, my point is, frankly, at a strategic level, um, uh, which is, are we imploring the totality of strategies yeah. that are necessary to address this? And, and while I have confidence on the long stretch of issues, which is why we put money into a number of, maybe the softer side, if you will, which I think help uh, prevent folks from going down the path in the first place, now what we're talking about are the most hardened uh, uh, and how you deal with and, and what's the strategy around how it is that we effectuate change at that level. Uh, and I think that, quite frankly, is a, is a, is a law enforcement question that I think has to be answered. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the request has to be put to us. If this is a resource question, then we need to know it. If it is something else, then we need to know that too. Commissioner? Um, so I know like the rest of you, we um, all have read a lot of material um, and um, the conversation the last couple of minutes has been um, to a large degree talking about um, folks either in reentry or, you know, pretty violent criminal acts, but we have in our city a lot of criminal acts that occur that are fairly minor, um, that um, involve juveniles, but also in, involve young adults and older adults. Um, there is, by statute in the state of Florida, there's a, a juvenile pre-arrest diversion program, civil citation, um, which is mandatory. Um, and we, we were a rather unique county in the state where we had a pre-arrest diversion program um, for adults. And it has been suspended for a short period of time here and we're trying to get it back. Um, some of us have been working with the um, state attorney to try to make that happen. Um, and I think he's satisfied with some of the changes he needs to make. But the fact of the matter is, commissioners and anyone that's listening, if you can keep people out of jail, there's a far greater chance they won't go back. Um, in a lot of cases, um, for young people, um, particularly, um, those that are up to the age of 24, 25, their craniums aren't developed yet enough. They do stupid things. Um, and when they do stupid things, you would hope that something minor wouldn't put you in a situation where you have an arrest record. Because if you got an arrest record, as we know, getting a job becomes all that more difficult for something stupid that, quite frankly, we probably all made stupid mistakes when we were younger. Um, and we still make stupid mistakes as adults. So I'm going to ask here. Um, because the recidivism declines considerably if people are not put through the criminal justice system. Um, 
one of the issues with the pre-arrest diversion program for adults is there's a cost associated with it. And not everyone has the financial wherewithal to pay the freight. Um, and I'm not suggesting that the existing program had not allowed them to go through it, but the fact of the matter is, um, if there is a way to pay this limited fee, it would help out. Um, so I'm going to ask this, and I have also suggested to a colleague I have, we have a colleague over at the County Commission, that they match us, because this is a city-county issue, um, that um, we budget $30,000 for the upcoming year to provide, for lack of a better script, better description scholarships for those that do not have the wherewithal to pay for the fee they have to get in order to go through civil citation. The way it works, I'm gonna bore everybody for a moment here, is if an incident occurs out, whether it's our police department or our sheriff, and it falls under the category, which is misdemeanor and some other things, not violent crime, not things of that nature, but minor things, the officer or the deputy on that location does a background check, and if they don't have any priors and they haven't gone through the program, before they can receive a civil citation, which allows them to go through some type of counseling, whether it's a drug issue, alcohol issue, a violent issue, and hopefully solve their problem. That's what we're trying to do here. And not everybody can afford to go through that. So I'm gonna ask if we could, and once again, this is an ask that involves the county to match us, to, um, to put $30,000 in this coming budget year. Um, and we'll have more details. I know the um, state attorney's working on those details now, so at our next, budget workshop, we've, I'll be able to talk about a little bit more. But this keeps people out, which in turn keeps them from repeating. The, the numbers are phenomenal. The only other, I appreciate that, uh, uh, Commissioner. The, um, I also think we've got to have a conversation with the state attorney around, and frankly, law enforcement period, around who gets offered. Uh, mm -hmm. Because that, that is a big, big issue, is the, depending upon who encounters who and what mood and how you display yourself to the law enforcement uh, individuals, the who gets offered uh, the diversionary um, um, option it becomes problematic. Uh, I'm glad you raised that issue. I think when the chief comes at our next one, he can talk to you about what TPD does. And I think on a large degree that mirrors the, the, the sheriff's department. Florida State University Police Department does not offer civil citations. That needs to change. Right. That, that's what I was going to on campus. Like, that I, I has know, to uh, change. Commissioner Miller wants to get the queue as well, but that that is the. If you remember, I brought that up at our, our workshop. That is the glaring missing mm -hmm. giant piece. So, if you depending on the color of the uniform of the law enforcement officer that you're dealing with, is the difference between a record and not a record. We Florida State University is the home to thousands of students that come from all over the country and the fact that they don't offer a civil citation when the other surrounding law enforcement agencies do has got to be addressed. So I, I would suggest whatever motion the city and county put forth, they try to make it contingent upon getting Florida State to Fine with that. come to the table. That and, and the application, right, of who gets offered. There is the campus issue where uh, Commissioner Maddox is pointing around which uniforms. And then there is the practical uh, matter of, of the discretion that gets exercised by whoever the arresting or encountering agency is. Um, um, in my opinion, and I, I think this requires a state attorney's instruction as for the, sh uh, the, the complicity of the sheriff, as well as the chief, around giving very clear instruction on, around if you don't have a prior and it's not a felonious, uh, then the option ought to be made available. Uh, Commissioner Ziffers is 100% correct, and it's backed up by the numbers that if you can avoid interaction in the first place, um, um, you, one, lessen the likelihood that you repeat, but you also don't get drawn into a system that once you're in, you get deeper and deeper and deeper sucked into. And this is a dollars and cents issue. The little tiny bit we spend on the front end saves I mean, literally hundreds of thousands of dollars on the back end. Sure. And so it, it, this is a budget issue for us. This is part of community policing. Mm -hmm. This is mm -hmm. keeping people out of our criminal justice system that's costing us all dollars. It shouldn't be there. Yeah. The only other uh, piece here, speaking of data and, and dollars and cents, is we had been trying out now for two years the evaluation piece on the human services side, strictly for the promised neighborhood folks up to this point. And I know that different points, they've updated different ones of up, uh, 
us of the effectiveness of it. We've heard agencies actually come to the city commission meeting to give their own testimonies of having been nervous about it in the beginning and now having um, experienced, I think, real successes. It is not included um, uh, as a part of our considerations to see that scaled. Um, I've asked the manager in our own one-on-one -on -one meeting, and I'll ask again um, in this setting, uh, that we really do get feedback from Mike Parker around their thinking of what it means to scale this up and in what timeline we can actually make it happen. And the cost is de minimis. Um, and what we're ultimately trying to do is to say whatever it is that we put our resourcing towards, whatever we fund, um, is proving that they're meeting the marks and not outcomes, and not outputs, but actual outcomes. And right now the system is not designed to take account of what outcomes are across the board. We're counting a lot of outputs. And that's no discredit to any agency that's doing any work because they're doing great work and much of it work of the heart. Uh, the question is, is not what makes us feel good about what we're doing, but what are the outcomes we're achieving by what we're doing? And the same applies to our own um, uh, to the conversation on the, on the law enforcement side. You know, uh, it, I'm not committed to doing the same thing because it feels good. Um, it is, yeah, are we getting the results that we're trying to achieve? Uh, so I'll, again, raise that as an issue for the, uh, uh, for maybe our 28th. Thank you, Commissioner, Commissioner Miller. Miller. Commissioner Miller. <laughs> Sorry about that, We're Commissioner. For you, <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, well, in the meantime, you've all said a lot of what I have, well, you've certainly laid a great groundwork for what I was going to say a few, about 10 minutes ago, which is that this is a, fighting crime is a, is a comprehensive effort. And it starts with preventing it in the first place or preventing people from being in a situation where they have the need to either to feed their families or just to make it through the day or the bills are pressing them or whatever. I mean, there are for certain people that are out to get somebody else and mad and they get into a fight. But the fact is that there are a lot of people who are involved in crime who may have too much time on their hands, who may not have enough food for their families, et cetera. And so we go at this generally with the money for the police. And I think with the community policing, it's been a very important step to take and to change the focus. But we also, as you all have all mentioned, there is the reentry program there is to prevent recidivism. And that's why I've always been so supportive of Legal Services of North Florida, because I think they also do that. Um, but on the front end, with Mayor Gillum's efforts to bring to everyone's attention early childhood development, uh, the um, second harvest last week, the fact that so many people, such a huge number of our population is food insecure. Those are the, um, the over the edge effort. The, all of these efforts uh, are happening in our community, but we, are we serious about prioritizing those for funding when people come in and ask. And I'm, I know that Ms. Collins is probably happy to hear this conversation because she's right there at the top of the list. But the fact is that are we, are we looking at our, health, our uh, CHSP asks with that, through that lens? Should we increase a larger portion of that CHSP money to go to the promise zone where these needs occur? Um, huge numbers of people unemployed. I mean, a 50% unemployment level in certain precincts in our community is just truly, truly tragic. So I think that, well, what I would appreciate is if our law enforcement folks and, and Ms. Barber would come up with a, a little bit of a, well, a little bit more definite uh, description of a comprehensive approach to how we, uh, where our, the money goes that we allocate through the budget process on those support services that either even to the tune of parks and the splash and jams and the things that keep kids busy in the summer. That's, I mean, I was over at the park on Pamuay the other day with my grandchildren and I chatting with these little boys who were playing over there at, who were about the same age and we were talking about where they were going to school and all that and they really didn't, you know, have a lot to do this summer. They didn't know what they were gonna be doing. And it's just all around us, but we just may not be aware of it. 
and the key, I believe, other than lowering the blood pressure of the country, which I think is contributing to some of this, the key is to, to somehow divert people away from getting into prison in the first place. And that is the only way that we are going to be able to even begin to afford to address crime and its acceleration levels. Uh, therefore, what I'm asking you to do is to, as you go into budgeting, to look at ways to prioritize programs that address all of those um, different aspects of safety, would be the word I'd use, keeping our young people safe as opposed to having them get into trouble. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Richardson. Just on a little different note here. Um, I know we've got an, an executive session scheduled for, is it next week or two weeks, the 28th? Um, and, and I know we have a long-term contract with both the um, unions. Ha have we been able to anticipate, Robert, what the cost of those, because I, I don't, uh, well, correct me if I'm wrong, is there a uh, fiscal impact that we have not anticipated uh, in terms of preliminary discussions with yes, sir. The, the unions? Uh, what's in your budget today is, I believe, a 3% increase over current year budget. Okay. Uh, the police contract expires at the end of this fiscal year okay. and fire. Same. Same, thing. Same thing. So both contracts okay. are up. So anything above 3% okay. needs to be added to this budget. Okay. Are we going through and items now? Uh, we can. Commissioners, we give a general feedback. With okay. And so have you, have you all begun those general discussions with the union representatives at this point to kind of give feel for where they might be? Yes. Yes, we have. Okay. And that, of course, will be taken into consideration when you start to build the, the budget yes, that you absolutely. present to us. Question. Yep. Okay. Okay. Commissioner Miller. I have a question on that. Um, you are saying that 3% increase, does that mean a 3% salary increase, or is that a 3% overall cost increase in everything related to police or fire? 3% salary increase is what we've All assumed. All right. Thank you. Commissioner Ziffer. Every year I'm the one that does this. Um, can we, I think we're going through items now, right? Yep. So yeah. we, we've, I know the consumer price index is not 3% and every year we build in the 3% for employee pay raises. Um, and I'm gonna be that person again that says that I'd like to keep that at 2%, which I still think is generous. It's um, certainly not as much as um, a lot of our employees deserve, but quite frankly, we we're four and a half million dollars in the hole. And um, that would represent about a $600,000 savings, as I recall. Did I get that right? I think so. So I'm just throwing that out there. I'm not sure if there's any agreement Sorry. among Sorry. my Sorry. colleagues. That's about, that's about right. To pay general employee pay raise. Well, we'll, we'll bring you back options. Across the board to all employees, unions and non-union? No, unions do. Well, union unions are keeping well, the negotiate. I'm, I don't here. expect an answer, but I, I just want to bring that up as something that I if you're going to talk about general employees, then that should include everybody. And that's just an opinion I, we can't negotiate that, yeah. that you can it, talk about in a couple Commissioner, would, would you allow us to bring back sure. a table that shows uh, what the impacts are by general fund across all funds and, and then put it in perspective with where we are with health care and uh, sure. right. I was just I was going to say my my one issue with that is if we're going to pass right. you're talking about a three you know two or three percent increase or pass of health care costs onto sure. our workforce it needs to balance out this isn't a take back I get yeah. Sure. yeah yep Go commissioners on. other uh, questions on on items that have been presented here or others commissioner Maddox just I wanted to flag again internal savings that can be uh, made by uh, doing things in-house rather than using outside vendors. Uh, I've had conversations with the manager about that, but I'd like to flag that to come back. I think it can result in substantial savings. Yeah. Thank you, and Commissioner Richardson. One other thing, Mr. Mayor, I know that uh, uh, layoffs may be inevitable, 
uh, at some point, but I, I would hope that the priority would be attrition and retirements as opposed to taking that drastic step of having to deprive someone of employment. I'm not saying that it may not come to that, but if we would make the priority be attrition and, and retirements as opposed to actual layoffs. Uh, commissioners, I don't know what the uh, I don't know that this has necessarily budget uh, imp implications, but and I know um, the builder community is making its rounds to different ones of us. If they haven't already, they probably will. But one of the things that was raised uh, in their meeting with me was around um, uh, a truer consolidation around some of the permitting uh, stuff. First of all, they were over the top congratulatory and, and complimentary of the work of our staff here at the city. Uh, but our, but the, the impact of not having a very, very similar set of rules across the board or at least understanding and predictability still impacts the industry, whether we're the culprit or the county's the culprit or what. Um, what I uh, committed to doing was raising this issue with the city commission and making the recommendation that how we used to do when there were issues that impacted the, both the city and the county as we appoint a liaison from the city and one from the county, they would hear the breadth of issues in a particular area and then come back should there be action required by the elected officials to then, you know, sort of take some action. Um, um, I would recommend that we, in this case, and I don't have a complete uh, dissertation on the issues that were raised. I think we could easily reach out and sort of understand those a little bit better, but send a communication to the county expressing interest in our willingness to uh, want to have a conversation um, um, around some of the issues that have been raised uh, by the building community as it relates to permitting. Commissioner Ziffer. Mr. Mayor, I had um, a similar conversation, not in an official capacity, but it was a builder that had expressed similar concerns to me. And um, while I have, <clears throat> absolutely nothing on my plate and I have all the time in the world sure. um, I did suggest to him that I would try to get engaged so if it um, if it is the play Scott's shaking his head yeah, yeah man you do it, it. Um, I'd be more than happy to work with somebody from the county to try to resolve what those issues are I think that'd be great and also uh, commissioners um, Commissioner Ziffer uh, accepting you know the the, the lead here if we could just maybe after a preliminary set of conversations come back with what the set of issues are yep. and then um, you know the commission will have our opportunity to say i'm interested in that i'm not commissioner miller well i just would like to add that the county and the city when I, well when i first came into office i set up a little group of folks to talk about just the specific topic of combining growth management departments with the county, and these were people like Cliff Lamb and Henry Martin, and I mean, people that use the systems, and ultimately came to the conclusion that two thirds of the residents in the county live in the city, and uh, it was their, it was their I don't know whether to say impression or feeling or experience that the city's rules were at least what were more well defined. They had more flexibility in the county, but that also meant a little bit of fuzziness where they didn't know the lines for sure. And, you know, there are problems, no doubt, with the permitting them in the city. And we've been working on those a lot in the last six years. Um, on this side, I can't account for any, but I can only keep up with one government at a time. So. Um, on this side, and I, I, it's just very important to understand that the urbanized area is very, very different as far as development scenarios than the county. And so just making it all consistent, I've actually even had somebody from one of our engineering companies tell me that they do work all over the southeast and that everybody's got a different system and so it's no big deal if there's a rule that's different here or there. So yes, I'm sure that it's the job of our developers to come in and tell us that they don't, that they want to permit today and faster. And I'm sympathetic with that, but it is also very important to understand that we have a pretty good city, we have a good permitting department, and although we can always make changes, we're dealing with a different scenario than the county may be dealing with, so. Uh, the only, um thing I request is that I continue to get to work with Wayne Tedder. Since he and I have been working on so many things together lately, I would miss you if you weren't on my doorstep every day of the week. Give him something else to so, do. I'm in. Great. <laughs> and Commissioner, just to, uh, I hear your issue there, and I completely agree. I don't think we're talking about 
the <laughs> same standard both in the city and the county. I think what we're saying is there a common rule book and are there any process pieces here that can be streamlined that makes it, because the impact is, is if it's easy in the county but it's still hard in the city, it, the end user, which is the one we want to be successful here while maintaining our yes, rules, we is, do. Is, but is impacted. And their job is to try to um, make it as easy as possible. So, and our job is to try to make sure it, it's the right result. The right result, so, but also efficient. Uh, and I think certainly on the issue For of residents. efficiency, we're mutually uh, agreed. Uh, whether you're the applicant or, or the one reviewing, we want a smart system that you can anticipate some predictability to it. Um, uh, and that it's an efficient use of everybody's time and resource. Commissioners, other items on the... Uh, oh, I have one. Yes, Commissioner. Actually, m my aide, Melissa, and I have been really working hard, and we've been printing money uh -oh. in the office. Is that for Rick? So I thought I'd bring this today, and I'll take I, I don't accept bribes. Uh, <laughs> oh, uh, I brought, thought I'd bring this over here today, and just every time I come to one of these budget meetings, hand over some cash for the manager to have to um, <laughs> to balance the budget and there's not quite enough there there's you know to do it but i'm sure he can find efficiencies I elsewhere if it were a nickel it'd be a wooden one uh, yeah. it doesn't spend uh, commissioner if, there, uh, if there's nothing further we will adjourn this meeting and we'll see you in an hour thank you to the staff thank great you. job guys yeah. thank you job. very good job <laughs> so she's a Indian giver. <laughs> <laughs>